the parts are in, so let's assemble the stealth burner. This has its own assembly manual, and I am following the version dated August 16th, 2022. Clockwork 2 Extruder. Heat sets. This should be easy now after all the repetition. Your soldering tip may stick out the other side of the printed parts and burn your work surface. To avoid this, turn the tip sideways. It also helps for the optional PCB heat sets where clearance is tight. Note, the top and bottom heat sets on this piece need to mount below the surface. The bottom one needs to go in perfectly straight as it may melt plastic on the other side. This may interfere with the gear movement. This guidler arm piece must be printed well or it won't fit without modification or a reprint. It's so tight and exact, I don't think I could pop the pieces apart without damaging it. For the BMG idler assembly, my needle bearings came pre-greased. If yours did not, some people pack the grease in, but Bontech recommends just using a tiny amount of lithium grease. I am assembling the slightly marked end of the shaft facing right because that is what I see in the manual. If I am wrong, please correct me. Don't try to pop the whole thing in assembled. Separate and place the gear with bearings in the plastic and then slide the shaft in. It may be easier starting from the right side instead, you will have to experiment. These are original Bontech parts, so the spring is spec 12mm long, 6mm outer diameter, and 1mm thick. The earlier comment about poorly printed pieces apply here as well. This entire assembly adjusts tension, so I am not fully tightening the thumb screw to allow adjustment later. Check both MR85 bearings for any binding on the shaft, which would require light sanding. For pressing in the first bearing, I used a AAA battery which most people have at home. Press it in straight because if it goes in crooked, it may damage the bearing or plastic. This kind of stuff ruins your day in the car community. To be precise, a 5mm socket is the exact size. The other bearing is simply dropped and maneuvered in place. There is nothing to press into. Note that this anti-squish screw is an M3 by 6 flathead. Up until now, we have been using a lot of round-headed fasteners. For the drive assembly, this filament gear has a set screw. The groove is specced 15.6mm away from the larger white gear. To fine-tune adjustment, add Loctite but don't tighten all the way down. For those without calipers, you can see the black gear is spaced ever so slightly away. When it came time to sandwich the pieces together, I noticed a gap in one corner due to a heat set sticking out. Take your time and correct mistakes like these. It's not hard and can prevent the plastic pieces from cracking when we tighten bolts down. Speaking of which, there is no need to over tighten this top bolt that is in open air. The plastic will bend and break before you can even get torque on it. Insert a piece of filament and check drive gear alignment. Since the set screw is loose, we can adjust the gear positioning as needed. Make sure the shaft does not stick out on the large gear end. Up until now, this is the worst set screw to tighten. This is due to lack of clearance and it strips easily. Use a good quality Allen key and put downward pressure on the screw head while turning. Attach the tension arm, but do not fully tighten the M3 bolt holding it in place. This allows it to move freely without binding. Same with the latch up top. Get a feel for how the mechanism works. The tension knob and anti-squish screw will fine tune the filament grip. Time to mount the extruder motor. The manual doesn't specify which way the motor wires should face. After searching photos online, I just did a mock setup with the cable bridge and cover attached. It makes more sense to mount the motor with the wires facing down. Leave the bottom motor screw loose. We do not want the two gears mashed against each other. There should be an ever so slight gap while still maintaining teeth engagement. After that is done, both screws can be tightened down. The remaining steps for the cable bridge and cable mounting are straightforward and omitted from this video. For the tool cartridge, I was puzzled regarding how to mount the Dragon hot end. I finally figured out you have to remove this top piece. It's secured by two screws that strip extremely easily. In my case, I lucked out because one screw was already out before the other one stripped. I simply twisted the top piece off and out came the bad screw with it. This heat block can be installed in two directions. I line it up in this orientation to allow more space between the inductive probe. Be careful not to bend these wires too much, try to keep it to one bend, and don't pinch it. 
This isn't in the manual, but the nozzle, thermistor, and heater cartridge may loosen at operating temperature. One option is to re-tighten these when hot. Another is to torque them while cold using thread locker. A loose heater cartridge has caused fires, so take this seriously. Next, attach the front cover. The Dragon hot end mounts with its own included fasteners, which fit the custom PIF parts. I then measure and trim the PTFE tube so it sticks out the top by 11 millimeters. Stealth burner time. It's hard to see and trim these supports, so take your time and use good flush cutters. Looks like I removed a little too much, but they only clip the LED wires in place, so not the end of the world. For the NeoPixels, I am referencing this diagram and it's hard to see where all the wires go, so take some time to look over it. Each NeoPixel has a data in and data outside, along with 5 volt and ground connections. As with heat sets, I bought a pack of 10, so I have extras if I screw up. Most wire pairs only come with two colors, so you need to find a way to label the third wire later. Here's the deal, if you have not done this before, it sucks. I was about to give up and just buy a wiring harness, since $10 is well worth the avoided hassle. But once again, here's the harsh reality that reoccurs throughout this project. So yeah, I decided to watch a YouTube tutorial and give it one more shot. I actually attempted this twice, the first time with 30 gauge wire, and 0.8 mm 60-40 rosin solder. Second time, I used larger 26 gauge wire and 63-37 solder that is a thinner 0.3 mm. I thought it would be easier the second time around, but nope. I cannot grab step-by-step -step clips of me doing this perfectly, so instead, here are some tips that may help the beginners. First of all, use tape, clamps, helping hands, or whatever to secure the work pieces. Parts sliding around are easily the biggest frustration. Temperature control is important. This process works best in a certain range. If it's too cold, the solder won't melt or flow properly. If you can swap to a thinner tip, that may allow for more precise control. These wires are small, especially the 30 gauge. You need small wire strippers and good luck telling if it's been tinned. Twist the wire strands tight before doing so, otherwise they may short out on the neighboring pads. Tin three pads on one side at a time. I found it easier to touch the tip directly on the pads and let the solder flow onto it. Watch for solder creeping onto adjacent pads, especially if you aren't using rosin or flux. This can also cause a short in other problems. Attach the middle data wire first. If that is slightly off, you can adjust it without disturbing anything around it. If you make a mistake, simply desolder and try again. For NeoPixels with 6 wires, it makes more sense to solder the bottom set of wires before the top. This is also drawn in the diagram, but it is still easy to mix things up, so double check your work. Most issues were solved by retinning the soldering iron tip. For example, this was the only way I could get wires attached to the pads. If in doubt, retin the tip before every step. The Voron website has sanity checks using a multimeter. I didn't quite show this correctly, but on the same NeoPixel, there should be no continuity between 5 volt and data, between data and ground, or between data in and data out. There should be continuity between ground in and out, and 5 volt in and out. Now between NeoPixels, there should be continuity between all three wires. Finally, make sure you have 5 volt and ground continuity between the tool head wires and the last pixel. Data will not have continuity. If you don't have a multimeter, all you can do now is visually check for any crossed or loosed wires. Here are both silicone wire harnesses, which I did an equally horrible job soldering both. It was easier to solder the smaller 30 gauge wire, even with thicker 6040 solder. However, this wire feels really thin and fragile. The larger 26 gauge wire is easier to keep still while working, but due to the extra thickness, I found it harder to attach the top wires on the six wire pixels. Buy multiple colored wires if possible. That way it's hard to mix up and cross over wiring between the LEDs. For the logo LED, I cut the controller in wires longer than spec, in case I need more slack while wiring the tool head later on. I wish I could show and explain this better, but it really comes down to practice. You can see how easy it is to fit 30 gauge in the stealth burner wire channels. There is no need to cut these wires longer than spec. 
There is more than enough slack and too much will be hard to tuck away. I am going with the 26 gauge harness and you can see the tight fit. Tuck the wires as best as you can. Make sure the solder joints on the logo LED are as flush as possible. Otherwise you may have trouble shoving that LED in. Moving on to the 4010 fan, there are two more supports that will break loose during installation. Make sure the fan wire exits from the top and that the airflow is facing the proper direction. Once again, smaller wires are better, just look at this mess. I can only test continuity on the 5 volt and ground wires. I guess I'll find out later on if the data wire got jacked up somewhere along the run. For the 5015 fan, the cover splits easily with a screwdriver and brute force. Use flush cutters to snap off the two years and find a way to grind it flat. You more or less have two choices. Pop in the fan and secure it with two screws. We already assembled the X carriage in the previous video, so just start screwing the major components together. And that's it for the stealth burner. I'll have to admit, it looks really badass. By far, wiring the LEDs will likely be the hardest step for the inexperienced. As frustrating as it may be, don't skip this step. It's one of the beauties of Stealth Burner. Remember, you can do it. When you are frustrated, every little problem seems to compound. So take a step back, grab a drink, and try again later. If you have not already, please like and subscribe and let me know how your build is coming along. Thank you for watching and see you all next time.